and welcome to gagrule.net. In this episode, we're going to connect the dots. What happened between Kurdish Mullah Mustafa al-Barazani and Saddam Hussein and what went wrong? Something you need to know all this and you must heard a little bit here and there, but this is the whole, whole package we put together. So basically, um, the, the Ba'ath party, they came in power. Ba'ath coup of 1968 and 1970 peace accord in July 1968, the Ba'ath party supported by the army overthrew the Arif government and assumed control of Iraq. Returning Ahmed Hassan Bakr uh, to power. The Ba'ath realized the toll the military's operation in Iraq were taking and signaled its willingness to settle the Kurdish issue peacefully. The Ba'ath initially hoped to seek an agreement with the Taliban fa uh, faction to bypass Barazani, uh, prompting Barazani to enter into hostility with the government again. Shelling Kirkuk in March 1969, Barazani's ability to secure aid from Iran caused trouble for the new Ba'ath government, which saw that it would prevent any conclusive military victory. So when they came in power, the Ba'ath, they were really doing a good job. They had three issues to deal with. Uh, one is the Kurds, the British, and the Iran. And so domestically, they, uh, they nationalized the British petroleum and that they put them in direct uh, uh, confrontation with the British. And, uh, but the revenue, Iraqi revenue, went from millions to billions. And they were really spending the money on the country like a crazy, like roads, bomb, infrastructure, construction, dams, you know. So Iraqi people were extremely happy, you know, what was going on because all the years, you know, Iraq didn't, Iraq had only one university in, in Baghdad, you know, and so the British was really sucking the country. So now they start building universities in every major cities and they even forced uh, uh, old people, 70 year old to get educated, to learn, uh, so, so they were really, really doing good job and the, the people were coming all over the world. So they wanted to tackle these three issues. The, so the British, they took care of, care of it, but that was not, not fun to deal with the British uh, colonies, you know. And so what happened is there was uh, OPEC oil meeting in Algiers, the Colum-Algier uh, Accord. So they sent Saddam Hussein, you know, Saddam Hussein at that time was just one of those people, uh, revolutionaries. So in 1975, Algier Agreement, commonly known as Algier Accord or Algier Declaration, was an agreement between Iran and Iraq to settle their border dispute and conflict such as Shat al-Arab, known as Arvart in Rud in Iran and Khuzestan, and serve it as basis for the bilateral treaty signed on 13 June and 26 December 1975. This agreement was meant to end dispute between Iraq and Iran and the border Shat al-Arab and Kazakhstan. But the main reason was to do with Iraq uh, Kurdish rebellion. So that's that really was all has to do with the Kurds and the Iraqi. The Iraqi problem was uh, Iran really had nothing to do with the Shia and Sunni. It was all had to do because the way the British draw the Iraqi map, and they give one map to Iraq, they get one map to Iran, and told each one the Shat al-Arab belong to you. And so they, the way you see it, those rivers, both they came down to this waterway called Shat al-Arab in Arabic. And so this was the dispute between Iran and Iraq. So this agreement was, okay, half for you, half for Iran, half for Iraq, and that's how this dispute was settled. So Iran will stop uh, supporting the Kurds, okay? So that was the whole idea of this agreement. And so uh, basically what happened is 
uh, Iraq and Iran form a joint commission to mark the boundary between the two countries. They set up headquarters in all over border. The commission ended marking the border in 26 December 1975 with the signing of joint declaration of intent. Iran uh, pulled back all of its soldiers from Iraqi and sealed uh, the border after stopping the support of the Kurds uh, suddenly without any declaration. Iran also requested the CIA and Mossad to aid military support for the Kurdish rebel. And that where that where brought Shah of Iran shot himself in the foot and CIA got rid of him and they wanted to put another government in place, but the mullahs, they were smart. Uh, they came in, they took over, and, and that's where all this uh, American hostage came to picture and all what you see today happening between Iran and the United States is all has to do with that and hostages and all this atomic bomb stuff, it's all is, is just another massaging things, you know. So, so basically, the, the Iran and Iraq, they agree to do that. So Saddam Hussein become a popular. This was raised Saddam Hussein star because he, he in, in, uh, in Algier, it was, the news was all over the world. And so his popularity become big. And so what he did also, Saddam Hussein got uh, he got in his car, and he and he drives to uh, to Iraqi region Kurdistan. He meet Mullah Mustafa Barzani, as you can see the picture there, and he offered the Kurds the following: the Kurds will have semi-autonomy; they can have their own parliament. Vice president gonna be Kurdish. Every Iraqi school will have uh, one class uh, Kurdish, and uh, and then the parliament can uh, come up with a budget for reconstruction of Kurdistan. So they both agree, everything was good, and as you could see also here, they both go out and they're celebrating with their agreement, and there was jubilation in Iraq. Everybody was happy. Kurdo Arab Raya, they were dancing in the street. The Iraqis were looking forward to go north, uh, enjoy the uh, Iraq because all the tourist area is in northern Iraq, right? So, what happened? Why these things didn't work? They both agreed. Here is what happened. As you know, like, uh, and also like here, also uh, the Iraqi president, Ahmed Hassan Bakr, reading the proclamation, the Kurd and Saddam, both are there uh, witnessing. So, Iraq and, uh, uh, Iraq and, uh, and uh, Iran, as you could see here, they were buddies, uh, uh, they were meeting, uh, everything was great. Every, nothing would, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't imagine this whole thing happened within months, you know. So, um, and also Iraq and, uh, Iraq and Syria, they were ba both bad party. They both are friends. As you could see, Saddam Hussein, half of Assad, they're all, there was no problem. Well, suddenly, Syria start confrontation with Iraq. They were gone on months and months and months and then become so so serious, they start threatening Iraq with cutting the oil. Well, you know, Iraq, Iraqi oil was all going through the Syria, you see? So, so what? How, so this guy, Hafiz Assad, because they have Kurds, right? And the Turks, they have Kurds. At this stage, nobody know even Kurd exist in Turkey because we're not allowed Kurd to say I'm Kurd. You see, they were, as far as the world and Turks concerned, they, was, they were mountainous Turk. So this was biggest threat to Turkey. 
Now those Kurds gonna wake up. So the Turks and the Syrian got together. They said, look, this is threat to us. We gotta do something. So the Turk says to the, uh, the Syrian, we have no deal with Iraq, so we have no leverages, but you have oil going through. You could cut the oil, because if you cut the oil, what else is Iraq gonna do? They're gonna be dead, because this whole thing just has to do with oil. Half of Assad agreed, and that's why half of Assad was threatening Iraq or cutting the oil. So, but Iraqis have no idea. They have no idea this is something to do with the Turks. So naively, they send delegation to Ankara. They propose building a pipeline from Iraq through Turkey, so because they wanted to have a B plan just in case Syria connect, uh, disconnect the pipeline. So the Turkey said, yes, but no. So why no? The Turks, they put five conditions. First, they told the Iraqis, you reverse giving autonomy to the Kurds. Two, move Arab from south of Iraq to north, move Kurds to the south, round out Armenian leaders, close Armenian schools, and all their activity. Okay, so Iraq eventually capitulated because they tried it, they couldn't. So Iraqis thought uh, Syria was their enemy number one. And uh, so the, you know, the pipeline project started going on and uh, Turks make billions of dollars from there. And so the, they, they scrapped the plan with the Kurds. They, uh, they started uh, the, the plan of moving the Kurds from north to south and Arab from south to the north. Um, the, the Kurds start their rebellion again. Uh, and then also in Armenian case, they when you know, Armenian in all those countries, they never get in politics. They were all business people. So they rounded up all Armenian, a uh, handful of Armenian business uh, leaders in Mosul, Iraq, uh, Kar uh, Mosul, uh, Kirkuk, uh, Baghdad, Basra, and they put them in jail for about a week or two. They put on the newspapers so the Turks make sure they heard about it. And, uh, and then they told the Armenian people that you must close all your Armenian schools in Iraq. You have to close all your sport activities. And uh, that's how we knew what this whole story, what happened. So we investigated through that. We know some bad parties in there and that we know this whole, that uh, we're connecting this dot, how it happened. And uh, so this is, this, is the, this is the story of how Saddam Hussein shot himself in the foot, listen, the Turks, and the rest is history. Of course, uh, the pipeline started through, and the pipeline deal was very sweet deal was. And uh, the Iraqis, like, they offered the Turks uh, that all the towns and cities on the way, they're going to get free oil, and I don't know how many percent the Turks going to get. You know, it was very, very sweet deal was they give it to the Turks. So now Turkey is happy, uh, so back again. Uh, but the Syrian and Iraqis are still their, their enemy. And so, of course, uh, Shah of Iran uh, was toppled, and he was... Uh, it was in, in air going around here and there to, to find a place to stay. The mullahs come into power. Uh, that's the consequence of that. And so the, so the Khomeini comes in power. Uh, in 1979, the Islamic revolution in Iran made Khomeini the country's leader. Khomeini wanted to spread the revolution to Arab Islamic world. This is what the rumor is. Uh, he threatened Iraq with invasion in order to free its people from the dictatorship. Iraq abolished the Algier Agreement in uh, 17 September 1980, which 
and led to the longest war in the region in the 20th century, the Iraq-Iran War. The war lasted eight years until the United Nations Security Council Resolution 619 ended with war and return both parties to the Algerian Agreement 1975. So obviously, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, he became a friend of the United States. He listened to them and he was a hero. He became a hero of the Arab world uh, by defending. But when the war was over, and those uh, the Arab leaders like Saudis and Kuwaitis and all those was calling Saddam Hussein our hero. Uh, now they turn uh, against Saddam Hussein. Uh, the British start uh, 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 drilling pipe uh, diagonally from Kuwait to Basra, stealing the oil and force Saddam Hussein to go to Kuwait. And that's another story how the Gulf War and all that, all the consequence and what you see today is happening. This is all because what Ankara did. So you could see when always I say Ankara is the epicenter of all atrocity in region from, Bang from Baghdad to Benghazi, from Damascus to Donetsk, Ukraine, it's Ankara, okay? So Saddam Hussein went from this to this. This is the consequence when you listen to Turk or when you make agreement with the Turks or you become a friend of the Turks, this is the consequence. Had he decapitulated to the Turks, find a solution with the Syrian, today he will still be in power. But that's what happened. This is when anybody who shake the Turkish hand like uh, uh, like this guy did Bashar al-Assad. You see what happened to Syria? It's completely destroyed. Millions of refugees and Turkey making billions of dollars from the back of the refugees. You don't shake hand of their Turkish ruling elites. You pay the price. But now, this guy is shaking his hand. And what's gonna happen to him? I've been saying this. Your day is gonna come, my friend Barazani. You keep shaking hand of this, this dictator, you're gonna find out in a hard way. So how about Israel? Do you think the Turks were in love with the Jews in Israel? And when they become friends? Of course not. They needed them to lobby for them in the US. And especially against Armenian genocide. That's all they were friends with it. And also, listen to this, why they become a friend with um, Israel and why now they throwing Israel under the bus and they need Islam. So now Hamas is their friend, not Israel. See what they do to the Turk? How could they switch the gear on you? Watch. The way it developed was very suspicious from the start. Turkey recognized Israel in 1949 not necessarily just because it loved Israel, but because that was its entry card into the Western camp. The, the fact that Turkey was with, uh, willing to have relationship with Israel had to do with its relationship with the West and the fear of the Soviet Union. And Israel was part of the West. And as you could see, all this chain of events, you know, uh, how the Iraqis, they were trying to do some good things, whether you like them or not, whether you like Saddam or not, uh, but they were trying to find solution with the Kurds, with the Iranian, uh, to help their country, build their country, but it only took one evil empire, the Turks, and created this chain of events and led to the war, Iraq-Iran war, millions of people died, and consequently, is this happened? In which is, in a few days, they, the Kurds will uh, commemorate uh, this uh, thousands of innocent men, women, children was massacred with a chemical attack. And so this is the consequence of uh, the, those, those problems. And uh, see, so the Halabja chemical attack, Bloody Friday, was a massacre against the Kurdish people that took place in March 16. 1988, during the closing days of Iraq-Iran war. 
in the Kurdish city of Halabja. The attack killed three to 5,000 people and injured 7,000, and most of them, they were children, elderly men, women, you know? This is what is atrocity it does. And so basically, all I do is, is one group says, ah, you joined this group, so now you deserve to be massacred. Simple as that. And that's exactly what the Turks did to Armenians. And they said, oh, you joined the Russians, so now we have to massacre you. See? And so there's thousands, hundreds of these stories, this genocide going on, and is it we're going to stop? No. Until Turkey being punished, the, the original, the, the inventor of genocide, it's still out there and walking. And unless that, that original one brought to justice, these things will constantly happen. As also you could see this, this, uh, this chain of events, it never ends. And even now, you see those uh, Islamic State, where I call them uh, Turkish jihadists, they're slaughtering, massacring, they're doing exactly the same thing, beheading uh, everybody. Of course, none of Turks been massacred or killed or murdered, but everyone else, the Kurds and Arabs and, and uh, uh, Americans and Europeans been killed. No, 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 no Turks being touched, not even the scratch. See? So that's, that's, you know who is behind all these things. Anyway, so I just wanted to say, and I, I feel sorry for the Kurdish people, and uh, but what can you say? You know, those things do happen, and it's unfortunate. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, Mullah Mustafa al-Barizani. I mean, this guy was really, truly a hero for his people, and he spent his life in caves, and, you know, running from one country to another country, and a very, very tough time. And obviously he was an orphan and, uh, at age five, uh, which now we're going to show you a little bit about his history. Early life. Mustafa Barazani was born in 1903 in Barazan, a village in northern Iraq, Kurdistan, a part of Atma, the Ottoman Empire. Following the rebellion launched by his tribe, he was moved along with his mother and rest of his family into jail where Barazani was only at age of five years. His father, grandfather, and brother were later executed by the Ottoman authority, which is the Turks, for other rebellion. At an early age, he joined other tribes fighting in Erin Sheikh Barzanji, a revolt against the British in Iraq. So you could see the man, uh, you know, he was... Uh, he was an orphan, just like the, the Armenian orphans and others that Turk invented, you know, like uh, the, so he's, he's totally, this guy is whole, totally different from his, uh, his son, uh, uh, this guy, uh, Barazani, uh, he's, he's, he's shaking hand of a dictator with his forefather, slaughter, massacre, Masoud Barazani's forefather, but he's still shaking his hand. But what can you say, you know? And uh, so that's that's a little bit history of of uh, Mullah Mustafa Barzani. So that you, at any rate, um, the Kurds themselves too, they committed atrocity against Armenian because they too uh, uh, trusted Turks then, just like now they trust the Turks. Um, in 1915. Uh, when this uh, criminal young Turks took a power and they too, just like now these Devatulu are saying, Musawat, Adalat, fairness and justice to everybody. And, but their fairness, justice turned out to slaughter, massacre and deportation. And so the, they told the Kurds that if, if we slaughter, massacre those infidel Armenians, Many citizens in Turkey, of both Kurdish and Turkish ethnicity, remember vividly what their parents and grandparents told them about what happened to the Armenians. Go 
که این زمان شد همه ارمنی هم بکشه در یه جهنم دقلت که در جنت اوان انسان از این نزانی ها خوش جهالت یا خود هر کسی چون خدا قلعه اوان انسان ها هنی ایکو سر سروت اوان دانی ایکو کچکی وانی بچوش با خودی کرن The door of the hell will close on you The door of the heaven will open on you So the Kurds did But did the door heaven open for the Kurds? In fact, they, what the Turks did, they opened door of hell for the Kurds. They slaughtered them, they massacred them. They wouldn't even allow them to say, we are Kurds. And that's, so they, the Kurds, they, they themselves committed crime too. But that's how the history works. And now they are back again, being a friend of the Turks. So we'll see. Uh, what's going to happen next 30 year to the Kurds? Um, this is history just repeating himself. Unfortunately, the Kurds never learned their lesson. And uh, what can you say? And just let the, let the history uh, write the right and wrong and we'll go from there. I thank you very much for watching. And uh, we look forward for the next episode. And have a nice day.